the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Notice the title. It's not closation. It is Revelation, which means it should be understood by those who desire to understand. Do you have Revelation 21, verse 14? If you have the King James Version, you may read with me. And the wall of the city had what? Twelve foundations. Finish that verse. And in them what? The names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Of course, that does not include Judas. He was replaced by Matthias. The names of the disciples are on the twelve foundations of the New Jerusalem. Are you with me? When Jesus told the disciples, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, those twelve men were the, were the beginnings of the New Testament church. Go to Ephesians 2. We have to look at the men who said, we will go to prison, we'll die for you. Because all 11 said that, of course, minus Judas. Ephesians chapter 2, we read verse 19. Paul is writing to Gentiles. God sent him to the Gentiles, and he sent Peter to the Jews. You have verse 19 of Ephesians 2. Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue. Give me clear, simple language, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but what? Fellow citizens are with the saints and of the household of God. Keep reading. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles. Come on. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, here again we have the apostles are the foundation of the early church, of which Christ was the chief cornerstone. And so we read in Revelation 21, 14, the names of the apostles, the disciples, will be on the 12 foundations of the holy city. Here we're reading that the names, or they are the foundation. In other words, when Jesus Christ called those 12 men, he called them to form the seed, the nucleus as what we know to be the New Testament church. Now, let's go back to uh, Matthew, not Matthew, Luke 22, and let's read verse 34. Luke 22, verse 34. Well, let's read 33 and 34. Let's get Peter's response and then Jesus. Luke 22, 33, 34. Do you have that? You may feel free to read with me. And he said unto him, what? Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Now, based on Mark 14, 31, we know all said the same thing. In other words, Peter spoke for all the other disciples. Is that clear? He spoke for them because the Bible says they all said the same thing. So we have the men who would form the nucleus of the New Testament church. And they said, we will go with you to prison, we will die for you. But Jesus said in verse 34, he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow before thou hast denied me what? that thou knowest me, thrice denied that thou knowest me. In other words, and of course, in Mark 15 or 14, 50, the Bible says, they all forsook him and fled. What am I trying to say? The nucleus of the early church, <laughs> at a certain point in their spiritual development, denied Christ. I didn't say that clearly. You look confused. Let me try again. All the disciples forsook Christ and fled. These were the men whose names subsequently will be placed on the foundations of the holy city. What I'm trying to get you to understand, the nucleus of the early church turned its back upon Christ temporarily. When they realized what they were facing, when they dipped their feet into the hot water, they ran. But what's our subject? The danger, of what was their intention? Come on, tell me. To go where? To prison? Come on. And to death. When they were faced with the reality, they ran. For Sir Christ, I don't know him. 
when a student decides to take exams on Sabbath, that student is effectively saying, I don't know him. I know my degree and I want it. I don't know him. Every act of disobedience is a denial of Jesus Christ. When I'm aware that the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do what? Any work. And I deliberately choose to go against that. I am saying by my behavior, I do not know him. But you remember I said they temporarily turned their backs on Jesus because they came back. Can you say amen? amen? Why am I bringing this to your attention? We are close to what is called the time of trouble. And everyone in the church loves Jesus. You see where I'm going? Everyone in the church have never been to a church where anyone said, I hate Jesus. So we all love Jesus, and Jesus complains, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It is easy to say, I love Jesus, and I say it. I say, I love him, and I like him. But when the trial comes, will I be faithful to Jesus? In order for that to happen, we must be faithful to him now in little things that do not constitute major persecution. Let me say that differently by taking you to Luke 16. It's 25 minutes to 1. I still intend to release you by 1. It does not take God long to bless his people. Elohite councils, preachers, cut your sermons in half. So I'm trying to, she probably saw me when she wrote that counsel. So I'm trying to obey that counsel. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? No, I said 10. Yes, I said 10. I think I said 10. Didn't I say 10? No. Then I have sinned. Okay, forgive my sins. Verse 10 of Luke 16. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me if you have my version. What does it say? He that is faithful in that which is, come on, is faithful also in much. Keep reading. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Now, that's a principle by which God deals with us. There are some people... They come to the church, they baptize, and the next week they want to be head elder. Are you following me? <laughs> they haven't proven their faithfulness in that which is least. They want to jump right into that which is much. The way God measures our faithfulness in large things is to watch our faithfulness, finish my words, in little things. Let's apply that to the time of trouble. That is a big thing. The Bible says, this shall be a time of trouble such as the world has never seen. Noah didn't see it. Lot didn't see it. Elijah didn't see it. Those at the destruction of Jerusalem in the days of uh, um, Jeremiah and in the days of after Christ went back, they didn't see it. There is coming a time of trouble such as the world has never seen. In order to be faithful to God in that time of trouble, we have to demonstrate our willingness to go to prison and to death in little things now. Because it is our behavior in the little that let God, lets God know how we shall conduct ourselves in the large. This very uh, unsettling statement Ella White makes in the book Last Day Events, page 173, paragraph 5. What did I say? Last day events, page 173, paragraph 5. I'm checking to see if you're listening. Here's what she says. Prosperity multiplies professors. By professors, she means those who profess to love God. Are you following me? When things are going well, everybody is faithful to Jesus. That's what she's saying. Everybody loves Jesus. I have a job. My children are in school. They have tuition. My car is paid. My house is almost paid. I just got to pay 10 more dollars, and my mortgage is taken care of. So everyone loves Jesus. Why? Because everything is going well. But she goes on to say, adversity purges them from the church. There's something called training camp in whether it's NFL, NBA, 
NHL or Major League Baseball, there's something called training camp. You talk to any athlete, they hate training camp. Are you following me? Because that's where the rookies are weeded out. The coach watches you who is ready for the real thing. When, you know, opening day begins this Sunday or that Sunday, they hate training camp. It is so hard. You want to be a Navy SEAL? They hate bugs. It's called basic underwater demolition something. The training is tough. You're allowed to sleep about once for an entire week. To weed out the weak. Weed out the weak. God has to weed out those who only worship him by what they say and not from the heart. And so the servant of the Lord says, prosperity multiplies professors. Everybody loves God because things are going well. Adversity purges them from the church. There's an adversity coming. In order to survive, as I said earlier, we must demonstrate faithfulness to God in little things now. There's something else that's essential in order for us to go to prison for God and face death for God. Let us go to Luke 14. Our subject is what? The danger of good intentions. Some students say, well, I will study hard for my class and they never do it. Or some young person, I'll obey my parents starting next week, and they never do it. Everybody has good intentions. I'll return a tithe as soon as I pay a debt. We all have good intentions. We're going to Luke. Did I say Luke? What chapter? 14. We'll read verse 26. Read this verse very carefully, very microscopically. Let me know when you found it. You have it? If any man come to me, read with me, and hate not his... Father, come on, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also. Finish the verse. He cannot be my disciple. Don't look so depressed. You see, a decision to follow God is a serious decision. You're saying, God before my life. You didn't get it. Let me try again. On the cross, Jesus said, you before my life. Still didn't get it. My fault again. God put your salvation above the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus says, if any man come to me and hate, that's strong language. Now we'll soften the language in a minute by going to Matthew. But focus on this. If any man came to come to me and hate not his mother, father and mother and now wife and children. Now who are they? Immediate family. And brethren and that's your family. Which means... The man or the woman who is prepared to face death for Christ must put Christ ahead of his family. It's easy to say that. It's not easy to do it. But that doesn't change the fact. God requires that we place him ahead of every other consideration. God must mean more to you than an academic degree. And if that's the case, you will not take exams on Sabbath. God must mean more to you than a job. If that's the case, you will not work on Sabbath. But as long as there's something that comes ahead of God, it makes it easy to disgrace God. And so Jesus who died for you and me, this is someone who gave his life for us. He is the one who said, you must hate your father, mother, brethren, wife, children, you know, sisters, and your own life. But let's understand what Jesus meant by going to Matthew. The Assembly Adventist Church has a principle of Bible study, which is here a little, there a little, come on, line upon line, precept upon precept. Let Matthew help us explain what Luke meant. Matthew 10. Do you have Matthew 10? Verse 37. 
Are you there? Read courageously with me. What does that say? He that loveth father or mother more than me, ah, is not worthy of me. Now, Matthew says, if you love them more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Luke says, hate them. What Luke actually means is love Jesus more. That's what Luke really means. But he uses strong, sometimes strong language is needed to capture someone's attention. And so Luke says you got to hate your father, hate your mother. He does not really mean that. What he means is your love for God must be so much greater than your love for anybody else. That principle is God first. That's how Jesus lived. That's how those apostles, after they were converted, that's how they lived. Let's look at the life of Paul as we continue good intent, the danger of good intentions. Go to Acts chapter 20. Luke says we must hate your own life. Acts chapter 20, we read from verse 22. This is the life of Paul. Our subject, the danger of good intentions, it is a quarter to one. Do you have Acts chapter 20? Who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. All right, very good. Whoever gave that answer. You combine Luke and Acts, you have one quarter of the New Testament, written by one man, Luke, who was a medical doctor, who sometimes traveled personally with the Apostle Paul. Luke, not Luke, sorry, Acts 20, verse 22. What, is the, what does that word say? And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. He is going into the relative unknown. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in what? Every city that what? Saying that what? Bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, the Holy Ghost has let me know I'm heading for trouble. Yeah, but the Holy Ghost tells you, you better believe it. I'm headed for trouble. Now read the next verse carefully. What does he say? But none of these things move me. Stop. You have a boyfriend. You love him a lot. He has a good job. Has a car. Has his own house. You're a Christian. He wants to be physically involved with you. Or he'll leave you. And find another woman. What do you do? You have to say like Paul. That does not move me. find somebody else but I stick to my savior that does not move me you have a boss who tells you you have to work on Sabbath once a month I'll fire you you have to be able to say that does not move me I'll be faithful to my savior and so Paul says none of these things move me the sad case is too many of us are moved by every threat from the world none of these things says Paul move me Keep reading. Neither count I my life what? Dear unto myself. What does he mean? His life meant less to him than his concern for his master. The work of Christ given to Paul was more important to Paul than his own life. And I'm speaking literally. In World War II, when the United States were winning the, the war, in the, 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 the naval war in the South Pacific, South, wherever that was, midway in those battles, the Japanese turned to a tactic using kamikaze pilots. You know what a kamikaze pilot is? They fly the plane right into the ship and they die. You cannot stop a kamikaze pilot. The United States has the most technically advanced military machinery in the world. They cannot stop suicide bombers. Are you listening to me? You know why? When your life is your greatest weapon, you cannot be stopped. Now the devil knows, for most of us, our life is our most precious possession, not faithfulness to God. And so when he tried to overthrow Job and he failed the first time, he went back to heaven. And God said, see, he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. And Satan said to the Lord, skin for skin, all that a man hath, what, will he give for his life? And the devil was overwhelmingly right. 
the devil is telling God, look, Job may not mind the loss of his material possessions, but if I threaten his life, he leaves, of course, he was wrong in the case of Job. The devil is right in most cases. When the life is threatened, we leave God in order to save our lives. And so Satan said, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Policemen tell you, if you're hijacked, give up the car. Why? Because your life is more precious than a car. Give up the wallet. Give up whatever, the cell phone, the iPad. Because none of these things can compare with your life. When the devil hijacks you, hmm, be prepared to give up your life for God. And so, believers say, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both into prison and to death. The moment the fire touched the feet of Peter, he turned and ran. And all the other disciples ran with him and left Jesus alone. When I say alone, I mean alone. Because in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. The reason why Christ did not run with the disciples, because Christ was human. Being faithful to his father, was more important to him than anything else. Now, let me tell you how human Jesus was. He prayed three times in Gethsemane, Lord, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. He felt it. He was suffering. He bled through his skin. You and I have never experienced that. He bled through his skin. He was suffering what you and I have never suffered, but his faithfulness to his Father was greater than his suffering. When we suffer pain, we go to the drugstore and we buy a painkiller. I remember once I had some dental work done, then the dentist gave me a prescription for, he said, be careful, this, this can be addictive, and he gave me this painkiller. Faithfulness to God is a painkiller. Let me explain. Remember the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Are you following me? Let me pray again. Father, I'm not far from concluding, but continue to pour out your spirit upon me not for my sake, but the message may be clear to glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus had been walking a long time. He was hungry. He was tired. That's why he sat on the well and began this conversation. The disciples, verse 7 of John 4, went off into the village to buy meat. You know, sometimes God has to remove certain people in order to save other people. Uh, you didn't hear what I said. God may have to remove your friends from your life in order to save you. He may have to get rid of your boyfriend in order to, or your girlfriend in order to save you. And so somehow God removed the disciples, sent them off to shop. While Jesus alone tried to save this woman, had the disciples been present, they would have got into Jesus' way. So he was tired. He was thirsty. He was also hungry. That's why they went to buy food. The lady left him, went to the village to give the good news. She had met the Savior. The disciples came back, so they crossed paths. The woman is leaving Christ. The disciples are coming. And they brought him food. They said, Master, eat. John 4, 31. Jesus said, I have meat to eat. Ye know not of. In his desire to save this woman, his hunger was not a priority. Are you following me? I said, love for God is a painkiller. I was talking to a friend of mine who has uh, three children. I said, wasn't the first birth painful? She said, yes. Why two more? She said, you forget. <laughs> just for love of this, you go four, five, six, twelve, fourteen. You just forget. And there's something greater than the pain of childbirth is this maternal desire to have this child to love. You men, you've perhaps seen a football game. You know how many football players play while they hurt? They're given injections to dull the pain with or without it. They play hurt. Why? Because they cannot let down the team. And so they play hurt. 
There must be something greater than the injured shoulder, the injured knee, and that is to do all I can for the team. And on that cross, what kept Jesus on that cross was love for his Father and love for us. His love for the Father and for us was greater than what he was suffering. That's what I mean by love for God is a painkiller. We're so focused on God that it numbs the pain. Let me explain further. There are people who have been shot and did not know they were shot. In the confusion of some event, they are shot. I'm not aware why because they were so distracted by chaos there are people who've had accidents in cars with a broken leg and did not know until they tried to get out and walk why in all the noise of metal crashing it distracted them they were not aware a leg was broken love for God should distract us from every other concern on the face of the earth Peter, at that time, when he said, I will go both into prison and to death, he was not yet at a point where the master's will and his love for his Savior was great enough. That's why Jesus says, when thou art converted. Jesus knew where he was, but still loved him. My listening friend, I'll ask you a question. Do not answer me. Are you willing to die for the truth? Don't answer me. Do you realize in history, many ages past, people willingly died for the truth? We read these stories and we marvel. We read Fox's Book of Martyrs, how men and women went to the stake and they stood while the fires were ignited and the flames came up and while they were burning, they were singing hymns. Because they loved Jesus that much. There's an old man called Polycarp. He lived in the same time of John who wrote Revelation. They lived together. It is said that he was a disciple of John. And he was the last of the, those great men who actually personally interacted with the John. And uh, Polycarp was an old man. He was faithful to Jesus. And the Romans came to his house. He was praying. And they waited until he was finished. He was so well known as a holy man. They waited while he prayed. When he was done, they told him he, they come to arrest him. He went with them. They took him to the, uh, the Colosseum, wherever, and they asked him, just sprinkle a little incense on some altar, recognize the Roman gods, and they let him go because they did not want to kill him. And he said, my Savior has never done me anything wrong. Why should I? All he had to do was sprinkle a little incense. All Shadrach or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had to do was bend the knee for a few seconds, then stand up and tell God, I'm sorry. All Daniel had to do was close his window and pray. No one would have known. But these men said no. And so that old man, Polycarp, he said, I cannot deny him. And they, I'm not sure if they fed him to the lions or they burned him at the stake. He gave his life because love for Christ was more valuable to him than his own life and so i'm saying to you and to me all our desires to be faithful to god i love jesus i love god i love the seventh day adventist church if we love for god does not exceed love for your own life when the trials come you and i will crumble last day events page 180 paragraph six last day events page 180 paragraph six five to one ellen white writes when the, the trouble, the trial, the storm, as the storm approaches, the time of trouble, the real, when the, it's right there, a large class who professed faith in the third angel's message, but were not sanctified by obedience to the truth, will leave their position and join the ranks of the opposition. What is she saying? In the time of trouble, when it starts, there will be an exodus from this church of people who prior to that had looked like the high priest. They just leave. That's a prophecy in the Bible, not just writing of Ellen White. Go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's five, four minutes to one. I said I may go to ten after. Is that okay? All right. Where am I sending you? 1 Timothy. What chapter? 
Reading from what verse? I didn't say. One. You have First Timothy. By the way, for those young people watching me, Timothy was a teenager when he worked with Paul. Are you following me? Which means that teenagers can be serious people. Not just video games and whatever else. Teenagers can be serious for God. Timothy was a teenager when Paul recognized how serious he was and called him to assist him. Oh, what a beautiful testimony. And Paul says of him, as a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. As a child, Timothy knew the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading verse 1, Father in heaven, as I continue today, God, I'm about to close. Speak through me still. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Read with me. What does the Bible say? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Stop. What is expressly? Come on, give me some word. What? Directly? Give me another word. The Spirit speaketh expressly. We have directly. Give me a word. Clearly. Give me another word. Hmm? Fast. Okay. What's that? Clearly. Freely, yes, 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 yes. Give me one more. The Spirit speaketh expressly. Honestly, unmistakably. Now, what does he say? Unmistakably, freely, directly, clearly. Keep reading. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Give me another expression for the latter times. The last days. Are those the days in which we're living? Yes. There's a prophecy. Even if we hadn't read what Eloi said, there's a biblical prophecy. In the last days, some shall depart from the faith. Now, this is not referring to the world. The world has no faith from which to depart. This is the church. Let's see that repeated somewhere else. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There were some Thessalonians who believed that Christ would come in their day. And Paul had to correct that error. That's what Paul is doing. They mistakenly believed Christ would come in their day. Anyone who studies the sanctuary service and the 2300 day prophecy understands Christ could never have come in the time of Paul. Verse 3. What does that say? Let no man... Deceive you by any... Stop. Let no man deceive you how? By any means. Let no man, no person, not your husband, your wife, your boss, the pastor, the guest speaker, let no one deceive you by any means. No tactic. No sly approach. Keep reading. For that day, for that day of Christ is at hand. For that day, come on, shall not come. Why? Except they come a falling away first now. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, in the latter times, many shall depart from the faith. 2 Timothy, it's, uh, Thessalonians 2, verse 3, they shall be a, a falling away. You have to decide. That prophecy does not apply to me. You didn't hear what I said. I don't mean you, I don't mean, I don't intend for you to make a statement that Peter made. I'm going to prison and to death and wherever else. We need to renew our commitment to Christ daily. I said daily, not once a year. You and I must decide by the grace of God when that exodus occurs of members leaving the church because their faith in Christ has never been deep-rooted, I will not be among them. Even if my wife is among them and my husband and my children and my boss and the pastor. This is no joke. <laughs> How can I say this and not depress you any more than I seem to have already done? Most people will be lost. What did Jesus say about the straight gate? Few there be that find it. What did he say about the broad way? Many there be. Now, if you take that as a statistical statement and apply generally in every church, most people will be lost. Even though God is not willing, come on, that any should perish. You have to decide, Father, 
by your unfailing grace, I do not want to be among those who perish. Salvation does not occur by osmosis. It is a constant decision to hold on to Jesus Christ. It is a constant. That's why Jesus himself said, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. God in his mercy will put some people to sleep because he knows they cannot take it. Who those persons will be, I cannot say. But my brothers, my sisters, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Remember the, 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 the incident of Peter and the other 11 disciples, or the other 10, Judas was gone. I am ready to go with you in, both into prison and to death. The Bible says when the soldiers came for Jesus, they all forsook him and fled. Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? If the answer is yes, then you understand the sign that you're God's child is the Sabbath. God gave the Jews two signs. Circumcision, which was private. You couldn't tell if a man is circumcised. The public one was Sabbath keeping. There is a decision we make for Christ. No one can see when it occurs, but they see it in our outward behavior. Are you following me? Whatever happens in the within must have an external expression. And so while at a physical level, circumcision was a private thing, no one knew, yet someone could guess you were circumcised. Why? Because you observe, come on, the Sabbath as a good child of God. There must be that commitment to God here. Now, circumcision simply meant it was given to Abraham after his involvement with Hagar. Are you following me? No, you're not. Are you following me? You know what happened in Genesis 16? Abraham got involved with a woman who was not his wife. She was a concubine. The suggestion was made by Sarah. Family members with the best of intentions can get you in trouble. It was his wife who told him, sleep with Hagar. And Abraham said, fine. After that, the very next chapter, God told Abraham, perform circumcision. It had never occurred before, as required by God. What God is saying, when Abraham had a child with Hagar, he was physically capable. Are you with me? I'm trying to be delicate. He was physically capable. So God said, cut it off. And trust me symbolically cut off what you depended on and trust me circumcision tells God that you're dependent on him you have no power of your own and so when Abraham was unable to father a child that's when he had a child by the power of God are you following me you and I must go through the circumcision where we cut off self-dependence are you following me and we depend completely on God. It is only under those circumstances that you and I will face the fires that are coming. But as I talked about pain killers, by focusing the mind on the life to come, it eases the suffering of this present time. Go to Romans chapter 8, and then I'll close. Romans 8. I'll close the subject, the danger of good intentions. It's a five after one. Thank you for allowing me to go beyond. God bless you for being so kind. Do you have Romans 8? Read for me verse 19. Not 19, sorry. 18 if you have it. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, come on, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now what is Paul saying? Yes, there is suffering. Mm -hmm. But you compare that to the glory that's coming it causes the suffering to pale in significance. When I, uh, the Bible says of Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame, despising the cross. In other words, when he saw what his sacrifice would accomplish, that meant more to him than the suffering of the cross of Gethsemane. As a matter of fact, when Christ suffered in the garden because all the disciples were sleeping, there was no one to support him, God sent an angel, the angel Gabriel. And the angel showed him all those who would be saved if he went through with the sacrifice. When he saw that, of course the father, he went because that was greater than his suffering. 
there must be something greater than your fear of persecution to come and that must be your love for God because of love for God I'll suffer this or that or the next there are soldiers who for love of country willingly give their lives on the battlefield my brothers and sisters I want you to recommit your life to God right now it's not a command it's a request as your brother recommit your life to God right now let me close by saying the Bible says the wages of sin is for what age group come on for which age group huh any age the soul that sinneth it shall for which age group all there is a heaven for which age group there is a hell for which age group I'm talking to young and old recommit your life to God the devil doesn't care actually the younger you are the more the devil wants you because he knows if he can get you young he has a chance to keep you forever and so while the Bible says remember thy creator in the days of thy youth the devil says the same thing remember me because once he has you he can keep you I was a Catholic when I was a little boy and the Catholics had a saying it's probably still have it give me a child for the first seven years I'll give you a Catholic for life that's no joke recommit your life to Christ and make up your mind by his grace day by day to be faithful to him at any cost the same way he provided salvation at any cost how many of you will say father I recommit my life to you by your indwelling power keep me faithful day by day can I see your right hand keep me stand with me you don't need the good intentions of Peter We'll ask God to keep us faithful. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If Christ is in you, and that's a literal event, but I can't explain it, it is his strength that will keep you. But just make sure he stays in you. By constant surrender, heads bowed, eyes closed, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you to God that Christ went through the suffering in Gethsemane he went to the cross, stayed on that cross because of love. Father in heaven, help us to place you first above everything else, every consideration, dear God. Because the very first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, whether of stone or flesh and bones. And so, dear God, keep us mindful that trouble is coming, but keep us even more mindful there's a glorious new world waiting for those who are faithful. Guide our steps, protect our children, use us to bring others to Christ. And when you come, dear God, save us, I pray. Save us, God, without losing one. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may be seated.